Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Graduate Institute. Uh, on behalf of uh, Philippe Burin, the director of the Institute, it's a very warm welcome for this exceptional event where we are going to be celebrating a book which has been produced um, in honor of Louise Arbour called Doing Peace the Rights Way, Essays, Essays in International Law and Relations in Honor of Louise Arbour. And the editors, Fanny Lafontaine and Francois Larocque, are both here this evening, and you'll be hearing um, from Fanny later on uh, some more details about the book and how you can get hold of it. Um, I'm not going to introduce uh, Louise Arbour now and all her achievements. She's well known to many of you here in Geneva. Suffice it to say, she was obviously the High Commissioner for Human Rights here. Um, she was a judge on the Supreme Court of Canada, prosecutor for the international tribunals for former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the head of the International Crisis Group. And um, for those of you in the room who are hoping to do a doctorate, and for those of you who have a doctorate, um, I'd just like to point out that Louise Arbour has honorary doctorates from 27 universities. <laughs> That's 27 doctorates. Um, But enough from me, you're going to be now led um, in the next part of the uh, proceedings by Georgette Gagnon, who is the Director of Field Operations and Technical Cooperation at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Before that, she was the Director of Human Rights for the UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan. And she worked um, on the Syria mission in Damascus, working as a Senior Human Rights Advisor to Mr. Kofi Annan, as his then role as the UN Arab League Special Envoy for Syria. She also has a law degree from Osgoode Hall Law School in York University in Toronto, and I think you'll be hearing more about her adventures in Osgoode Hall later. So, Georgette, you have the floor. Uh, good evening. Madame Arbour, Professors Clapham, Shabas, and Lafontaine, Assistant Secretary General Hochschild. Friends and colleagues, good evening. On behalf of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, it is a huge honor and pleasure to welcome you tonight, both to the Graduate Institute, which represents Geneva's long tradition in promoting human rights, international cooperation, and humanitarian dialogue as central to multilateral diplomacy, and to express our deep admiration and appreciation to Louise Arbour for her fierce and unrelenting leadership in the pursuit of peace, with the imperative that real peace requires full respect of all human rights and a robust concept of justice for all. The publication launched tonight, Doing Peace the Rights Way, is our collective tribute to Madame Arbour's global leadership as an inspirational and fearless advocate for peace, the rule of law, and human rights. You will hear tonight from several of the scholars who contributed to this collection of excellent essays, and also from Madame Arbour, whose wisdom, words, and experience continue to guide us all, and is particularly salient in today's world, political world, very political world, with its new and mounting human rights challenges uh, that we continue to face. Before we hear from uh, our other speakers, I've been asked to highlight a few milestones in Madame Arbour's extraordinary career and work as an international jurist and pioneer in the promotion of international law and human rights. As a Canadian, and with other Canadian colleagues here tonight, we recall Madame Arbour's landmark judicial inquiry on allegations of abuse at the Kingston Women's Prison. This was one of the first such type inquiries in Canada, and that place was eventually closed. And many of us, me included, had the privilege of having Madame Arbour as, I, as our professor, in my case of criminal procedure, or crim pro, as we called it, at Osgoode Hall Law School at York University in Toronto, where she infected us with her passion for criminal law and international human rights law. And what was even more fun is when, during my time there, when I was taking crim pro, 
Madame Arbour was pregnant with her third child, as I understand, and we all got to, to leave the course early because she was giving birth. <laughs> However, we had to do our exam a little bit later, but uh, that, that was really quite something at the time. At that time, Professor Arbour's words then resonate even more strongly today as we witness the regression in respect for democratic principles, rule of law, and human rights in many countries and regions. When she said, the democratic state of a country is measured by the substance of its jurisprudence. In recognition of Madame Arbour's outstanding legal acumen, in 1999, she was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada, where she made further landmark progressive rulings. Her internationally recognized legal expertise and professionalism also brought her to the United Nations, when she was appointed as Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and then for Rwanda. Two horrors of our recent history from which we still have too much to learn. And we've had a recent anniversary on Rwanda. There, she indicted then Serbian President Milosevic for war crimes, the first time a serving head of state was called to account before an international court, and also indicted several other leading military and civilian leaders involved in war crimes and genocide. Her statements as prosecutor never let us and the world forget that behind these massive genocides, there were countless human stories and people, a mother, a brother, a daughter, who needed to know what happened, who deserved respect and had rights to truth and justice, which states and the international community were obliged to realize uh, these rights still not fully realized for many. She then took on the job of UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in a moment of deep sorrow after, the High, after High Commissioner de Mello's death in the attack on the UN in Baghdad. Commissioner Arbour's independence, integrity, and vision made the staff stand up and recommit their brains, expertise, energy and efforts to meet head on the realities of those who suffer the most through her and the office's 2005 plan of action. During High Commissioner Arbour's tenure, the office's field presences were expanded at country and regional levels because as she said, UN human rights teams need to be on the ground working daily with states in positive ways to change policies and practices that repress and violate people's human rights. Monitoring, investigation, fact-finding, analysis, reporting, formulating recommendations, advocacy, technical assistance. This is still what we do today, but even better uh, now. But it was Madame uh, Arbour who started this. And I'm pleased to note, particularly in my role as Director of Field Operations and Technical Cooperation, the office today has more than 76 field presences around the world, with states asking for more. Under her leadership, the Human Rights Council was established and the Universal Periodic Peer Review of all member states. And all member states have signed up to this system. It's now completing its third cycle, has produced a wealth of recommendations and actions, and reminds us of the achievements since the UDHR, but also the long way ahead to ensure no one is left behind on the path to inclusive development, human rights, sustainable peace, and security. In her role as High Commissioner, Madame Arbour also took on political and military leaders, who shall we say were not the most human right friendly and actually got some changes. I have a very interesting story from our time together in Afghanistan when the High Commissioner Arbour came to visit. However, I've been told it may be politically incorrect 
for me to say that to this audience, so I'll save it for later. But, uh, but shall we, let me just say, we dealt with some very tough customers who were similar to other tough customers who are still around in a big country called Russia. And we did get uh, changes in uh, access to detention facilities and reduction in torture by security forces in Afghanistan. Her uh, internationally recognized commitment to peace and justice then brought her to the presidency of the International Crisis Group and most recently back to the UN as special representative of the Secretary General for International Migration. In that most challenging role, some might have said mission impossible, Madame Arbour oversaw negotiations on the Global Compact for Migration, which was finally approved by 152 countries. Again, she was a pioneer in telling it like it is. Prevention combined with justice is a key factor that requires adequate focus from the outset, a sense of justice that is far from being enjoyed by millions of people on the move, including millions of children and young people fleeing violence, inequality, discrimination, extreme poverty. Let me conclude by paraphrasing Madame Arbour. Success, whether in human rights, peace or development, will not rest solely on reaffirmed commitments to implement fully international acquired obligations through more policies and more sophisticated designed regulations. Rather, success rests in large part on the sustained engagement in word and deed to changing the optics and rhetoric on so many fronts. This truth and call to action could not be more relevant in the face of growing attacks on human rights defenders and media freedom, the rule of law, rising unchecked hate speech incitement. Success, of course, also requires courageous, honest, bold, persistent leadership, such as that of Madame Arbour, whose example and leadership continues to serve as our compass, our inspiration, and our imperative to be better leaders and advocates for human rights and the rule of law. And we look forward to hearing more of that inspirational talk tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Before I embark in my more formal presentation, I want to tell you a little story that will illustrate how, at times, uncomfortable I am in talking about my work, uh, in large part because I tend to get very carried away with my great enthusiasm for the many opportunities I've had in different fields of work. And in one occasion, and this you'll understand uh, why I have to say that at the outset, when I was the prosecutor for war crimes, this was very novel, um, generated a lot of interest all over the world. I was asked to come and give a talk at a, an American university, and I was told that I would be met at the airport by one of the professors. So this person met me there, and we sat in his car on our way to the university, and he said, oh, we're so excited to have you because, you know, this prosecution of war criminals is so important and exciting. And I said, yeah, no, tell me about it. It's the most, frankly, the most important thing that I thought I would ever see unfold in my lifetime. It's cutting edge, it's novel, it's extremely challenging, blah, 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 blah. Continued talking about my work in these extraordinary terms. And because I had to catch my breath, I stopped and I said, and what do you do? He said, I'm a physicist. Oh, I said, and what are you working on? He said, the future of the universe. <laughs> oh, I said, oh, that's very good too. <laughs> so the publication of this book, in fact, brings me back um, into 
a lot of these past adventures of mine. And I have to say, uh, when Fanny and Francois Larocque launched this, uh, this process, assuring me that I would have nothing to do with it and, and so on, I thought, oh, maybe that's going to be one of these academic adventures that doesn't go anywhere and doesn't produce anything. And then, ta-da, we have a book. And when I first looked at it, I realized that uh, it's very hard to summarize what feelings it triggered in me, certainly one of nostalgia. And also, I have to say, a tinge of regret for having abandoned, largely abandoned, many, many of the topics that I was passionately involved in, as the anecdote uh, illustrates. And also, um, somehow with a sense of regret that I, although I've moved on to other things that I found equally interesting, when I read each one of these essays, I thought, oh, I should have stayed with that. That was really, really interesting. So I urge you to look at these many essays, and I'm sure you'll, you'll find the same uh, uh, level of interest. But more than anything else, looking through that book brought me a huge sense of admiration for the many, many people I've worked with in the course of my extremely varied uh, career, and in particular for the contributors of this book, many of whom are here tonight, some of whom um, are going to be part of our conversation here. Uh, the, the quality, the insight that they bring to these topics, as I said, uh, generates on my part some regret that I've abandoned some of these issues. And I do want to single out in particular the editors of the book, Fanny Lafontaine and Francois Larocque, both of whom are my former law clerks when I was in the Supreme Court of Canada. And I'll say publicly, I find it extremely annoying to see them so determined to drag me back <laughs> into things that I was determined uh, to leave uh, to them and their young colleagues. So I hope that today's event will take place more in the form of a conversation, debate, questions, exchanges. Um, I think it's the best way that we could do justice to the breadth of issues that are uh, reflected in this book. So I will keep my remarks uh, quite general, but I'll start with a question that apparently I posed in 2006, and I say apparently because I found it in the book in an essay that Lisa Oldring wrote, in which she recalled that I said in 2006, I asked the question, has the world entered a, quote, new normal in response to the threat posed by terrorist activities? And if so, what is it about? What is this new normal? So almost 15 years after a suspicion that this new normal had started to emerge, and with this new century actually now exist, exiting its adolescence, I think we can and we should reflect on where we stand on our reliance on the rule of law, the rule of law which, in my view, has been and continues to be the most useful organizing principle, and demonstrably so because we, are, we leave behind us, uh, I think, the most peaceful and prosperous chapter in human history. And as we might be concerned with some erosion of the rule of law, both as a norm and in its application, we should be reminded of the cost of leaving it behind. Now, I say here, when I refer to the rule of law, I refer to the rule of law in its only appropriate, rich, and substantive understanding as embracing the fundamentals of good governance as well as the principles of equality, justice, and accountability. Put in very simple terms, law, including international law, has greatly contributed in the second half of the 20th century to the management of often conflicting interests and power bases, all the while, the while seeking to advance a general public good. It has done so imperfectly, uh, but the course was relatively clear and the objectives were wor worthwhile, even when the means were inadequate and the efforts lukewarm. This, of course, is particularly true in the field of human rights law. In fact, a Canadian politician has recently been taken to task for suggesting that the law was at the service of politics. He was quick, quickly reminded by some that it's actually the other way around, that politics is subservient to law. For a general public debate, I think this is an interesting question. Is the law constraining politics, or is politics constraining the law? 
I suggest that in that respect, we are in the process, maybe inadvertently, of creating a, quote, new normal, and that we should be concerned about that. In mature democracies, and frankly, in emerging ones as well, constitutionalism had always promised the latter. The rule of law was the framework within which political choices would be made. The fear of terrorism, particularly after 9-11, and the responses that it provoked challenged and stressed that framework. The current rise of populism, of nationalisms of all sorts, and the very unfortunate retreat of multilateralism see, seem to be entrenching the latter. Politics rule and the law legitimizes. And all this is against a background of weak compliance and enforcement when the law articulates rules and principles that don't have much political currency. So more than any of its specific manifestation, I believe it's this global threat that we must be alive to. So in these introductory remarks, I just want to single out a few examples of tensions between law and politics, and I'll focus also on some of the unintended consequences of a severe, robust law and order agenda. So I'll touch on drug policies, financing of ter well, terrorism, and particularly financing of terrorism. And more loosely, I'll make some references to the, I think, still emerging doctrine of the responsibility to protect. So my broad purpose here, beyond these examples, though, is to advocate for the integrity of the rule of law in which human rights, of course, play a central role as the best method for managing conflicting interests, preventing abuses of power, and ultimately avoiding and averting violent conflict. I am just now rejoining the Global Commission on Drug Policies under the current leadership of my friend Ruth Dreyfus, who's here. I'm delighted that she's here, and I'm even more delighted to catch up with her later this week since I've been absent from the work of the Commission in the last two years when I was back working full-time in the UN. This is a field in which the international legal framework, and I'll summarize it by referencing only to the single conven convention on narcotic drugs, has set the completely illusory objective of a drug-free world while producing extremely harmful consequences. Whether these consequences were unintended is irrelevant. More importantly, the question is whether they were predictable, and even when they were not, are they now being addressed and corrected? I think that's the way we need to test the unfolding of policies through uh, legal rules. In addition to the disproportionate impact on vulnerable populations, including youth and people with mental health issues, the implacable prohibitionist mandate of the convention has been an obstacle to sound public health policies, useful, of course, in the prevention of many communicable diseases, and has reduced, if not prevented, completely access to pain-relieving medicines in many parts of the world. Politics here are not, only impede, are not only impeding progress, but this is an area where politics has enlisted law as an implementer of bad policies, thereby legitimizing these bad policies and making reform painfully slow, if not impossible. This, in addition, creates the dilemma of inviting disregard for legal constraints in the pursuit of the greater good. That, I suggest, is highly undesirable, uh, if at time unavoidable, uh, as a course of action, because it may invite others to disregard other laws that they don't like, but for much less valid reasons. Now, steps have been taken in the right direction in uh, moving towards uh, more uh, sensitive, evidence-based drug policies, including, for example, the recent decriminalization of cannabis in Canada. But the impetus for bolder, broader action there and elsewhere remains confronted to an unreceptive political environment. Let me turn now as another example to the question of terrorism. The widespread fear of terrorism in the last two decades has had immeasurable consequences. Some were predictable. For instance, in the constant tensions 
between liberty and security interest, it became much easier for states to promote security-related measure, and unfortunately, it also became much easier for citizens to surrender many of their liberty and privacy rights. A creeping erosion of human rights ensued, as well as an us and them mentality, which inevitably threatens the enforcement of legal protection for unpopular minorities. Other consequences of the so-called war on terrorism were less predictable, but prove equally difficult to address. For instance, international pressures on states to adopt robust methods of financial control in an effort to curtail the financing of terrorism, as well as money laundering and movement of the proceeds of crime, uh, have also had adverse collateral consequences that are now widespread and very well entrenched. As a result, the unconscionable cost, high cost, of the transfer of remittances, remittances are small sums of money that migrants send back to their countries of origin, so the, the high cost of transfer is largely attributable to these burdensome oversight uh, mechanisms, which are very difficult to remove or even to adjust after they've been put in place. And to give you a sense of the, the proportion of these adverse consequences of this type of legislation that is seen as necessary and very useful, the average cost of the transfer of the nearly $450 billion dollars that migrants send to developing countries every year, the average cost of just shipping that money is around 7%, while the World Bank has consistently been calling for a, a reduction to closer to 3% as an acceptable average. This is an example of the kind of collateral, allegedly unintended consequences of uh, allegedly robust, enlightened law enforcement and law and order policies that have uh, uh, consequences that are very difficult to, res to resolve and revert. I want to say just a few words about the responsibility to protect, again in the context of, re of reflecting on the tensions between law and politics. So in a broader political theater, the NATO military intervention in Libya in 2011, which was authorized by the UN Security Council against the backdrop of the responsibility to protect doctrine, has, in my view, also proven to be an ill-advised political recourse to law, or at least to a broad idea of legality, but without the rigorous steps that a proper legal doctrine would require. True, R2P, responsibility to protect, was not an established legal doctrine. But to the extent that many of the proponents of military interventions relied on R2P to advance their argument and to secure the assent of others, they bypassed the crucial steps which had been well articulated in the report that gave birth to this doctrine of engaging in a careful anticipation of the likely consequences of the intervention and in a broader, sober balancing of the harm and benefits um, anticipated uh, from as consequences of the action that they were likely to take and the consequences that were likely to arise. The deficiency in that not having recourse to a proper legal methodology, that deficiency became even more alarming when the initial humanitarian project in Libya quickly transformed into regime change. An effort to assess the likely consequences of the use of force in that case might in fact have revealed very likely the likelihood of that so-called mission creep and would have quite possibly precluded obtaining the consent of at least some members of the Security Council. These are, in my view, some examples of the current, but by no means novel, tensions between law and politics. I suggest to you that as politics today are becoming more divisive, more adversarial, less responsive to rational, evidence-based arguments, in that context, embrace of the rule of law becomes even more imperative. This includes the fearless promotion of human rights norms, the courageous insistence on the application of these norms, and alongside the mobilization of the legal profession 
to ensure respect for the judiciary as the preeminent nonpartisan forum for debate and adjudication. This, I believe, is a very tall agenda for all of us. Thank you very much. Good evening. This is so wonderful to see uh, this crowd and to see so many young faces. Uh, students, welcome. Uh, my name is Fanny Lafontaine. I'm uh, one of the co-editors of the book. I will just say a few words before we launch this fascinating discussion with uh, Louise, Fabrizio Oshield, Bill Shabus, and Andrew Clapham here on stage. Um, so Louise um, has been a mentor to me and a friend for a number of years now, and this idea came uh, to write a book uh, in her honor uh, quite a while ago, right, uh, with uh, Francois, who was also a clerk with her at the Supreme Court of Canada. I also worked with her later in Geneva, and it was such of a, it was a bit of a selfish idea in the end, because celebrating her was just the occasion to basically get back in touch with my dear friends from uh, Geneva and from, uh, from elsewhere, where we uh, basically had uh, such a good time. And so we uh, basically gathered people who worked with Louise, who interacted with her in different ways along the years, and we basically had all in common two things. They're all great minds, brilliant people who've done, as Louise has mentioned, inspiring work. Uh, throughout their careers and still today. And they also have in common that they love Louise. And I think they love, she loves them back. And so throughout the book, uh, throughout the book is obvious not only their commitment to their topic, which they tackle with great uh, expertise, but also uh, their admiration for her work and uh, how much she inspired them. And so I'm inviting you to, of course, look at the book. There's a few copies. This is not really to sell books tonight. This is to celebrate. But there are a few copies and where uh, Louise will be standing. Uh, well, be standing. Hopefully, you'll be sitting. But um, <laughs> after the event, to uh, perhaps sign a few copies or sell flyers if you're interested. Um, it's a very varied book because it reflects Louise's career. And this discussion as well that we'll have uh, tonight also reflects the variety of the topics that she tackled uh, in her career. Today is more about international law, but obviously she's had a tremendous impact, as Georgette has mentioned, uh, on Canadian law. And so, um, so first, before we start, I won't talk too long. I just want to make my thanks already, because uh, at the end, nobody will be listening. And now you're all listening to me. I can see that. This is great. <laughs> I want to thank the Institute uh, for uh, organizing this. Andrew, Jacqueline, Lina, I don't know where you are, but thank you so much. Uh, you've been of great assistance, and it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I also want to thank uh, the uh, OHHR, uh, Office of the High Commissioner, of course, the High Commissioner, Georgette Gagnon. Uh, I want to thank Pablo Espinella from the office, who's also a contributor to this book, who's uh, helped tremendously in the organization of this event. So Pablo, thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank the Canadian Partnership for International Justice, um, which is funded by uh, the um, Canadian sort of Social Research Council and who's helped the contributors come to this event. And uh, so thank you. Um, we are four of us here uh, who've written chapters for Louise's book, but in the room uh, there are others who uh, are present. Some of them, some of the contributors couldn't be there, but some of them are here, and I want to say hello to them and point uh, them out to you. So Pablo Spinella, I mentioned, uh, from OHHR, who's written on uh, migration and children. I won't talk about the topics. It's going to be too long. Mona Rishmawi, who is my boss at the Commission of Inquiry for Darfur and uh, who um, led led me into being, I think, I was going to say, a very good human rights lawyer. <laughs> she was 
she was really hard on me. And I thank you for that. I became a better person. Um, when I was, I'm so happy to see you. Lisa Aldring, who was uh, one who I cried on her shoulder when Mona was hard on me. <laughs> Lisa Aldring, also from Wichita. I'm so happy to see you. We have from Canada, Natasha Bach, uh, who was, you guys are separated in a room, who was also a clerk for Louise Arbour uh, with me uh, in, uh, at the Supreme Court. And of course, my co-editor, my dear friend, Francois Larocque, who's here and uh, who's, uh, it's because of him basically that the book has finally been published. Um, Louise has mentioned that uh, it was, she thought it was some kind of academic endeavor that would never really finish. And as you can tell, the contributors for the book are not really from academia. Some of them are, uh, but I'd say many, if not most of them, are practitioners working either in uh, the legal world in Canada or at the UN. And I would say that's probably why it took so long for the book to be published, <laughs> right? Because the academics did so well. So today, um, today we will, we have the great uh, pleasure to have a, I mentioned them, three of the contributors here today. We will discuss um, Louise's ideas that she mentioned, uh, but also we will divide the discussion in three main themes that basically follow uh, Louis's uh, international career. Uh, the first theme we, uh, we've decided, actually we say we decided, but Louise ordered us to do it this way. So this is how we do it this way. So the first thing we'll tackle is international justice and conflict. Uh, the second theme is human rights. And the third theme is migration. So as you see, it's very broad. The idea is uh, each of our uh, colleagues here will do an introductory presentation, five minutes, sort of provocative, maybe talk, uh, or sort of raise some of the main issues that, uh, that are of concern in that topic. And then we'll have a, an interactive discussion uh, on the topics that all uh, obviously have cross-cutting um, themes with them. So before we do that, um, I would ask my colleagues here just a few words about them and who they are instead of you hearing me again say all of our bios. So if you don't mind just taking a few seconds to introduce yourselves and if you want to say where you met Louise, that's, that's also possible. Um, the mics are open, so Fabrizio. Oh, Bill. Um, I'm Bill Chavis. I was Fanny Lafontaine's doctoral supervisor, and I think <laughs> <Another bad person. laughs> I think I think Louise had something to do with you coming to meet me. I remember meeting you at the at the Palais uh, uh, in the cafeteria to talk about you doing a doctoral yeah. thesis. That's not really about Louise, but I have something I'll say later. <laughs> A connection with Louise. My name is, is Fabrizio, and I had the privilege to work with Louise, as well as many other wonderful people in this room, uh, in uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um. I'm Andrew Clapham. I teach international law here. I've been very lucky to have been entertained by Louise in her house. Fantastic dinners. Not a Canadian lunch at all. She provides all the food and uh, <laughs> drinks. Uh, great hostess. Um, and I've also been studying high commissioners as an idea. And so I sort of have been watching also as an academic, uh, Louise. We're all watching Louise. Um, so this book, Louise has said this book, uh, we were very annoying in publishing it. And the idea, we mentioned it in the introduction, was not to celebrate her career per se, like as an au revoir, like she'll ever retire, <laughs> uh, but to celebrate with her. So that's why she's on stage with us and we're very happy to be having the discussion with her. So to kickstart, I'd ask Bill to please say a few things about international justice and conflict. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Um, let me start with uh, talking about Louise as a pioneer of international criminal justice. She wasn't there at the very beginning. I mean, the very beginning was Nuremberg or um, the Paris Peace Conference or something. But in the modern phase, which begins with the Yugoslavia Tribunal, really, she came in very early as the second prosecutor um, and inspired choice. Uh, I think Richard Goldstone has, according to the According to the standard narrative, Richard Goldstone, who Louise knew from South Africa, um, was, was the person who put her name forward for the job of being the second prosecutor. I remember when, uh, when her name started circulating because I started getting phone calls and emails. I was then 
uh, teaching at the Université de Québec à Montréal. And I started getting uh, people calling me and writing me, wanting to know about her from, you know, sort of activist academics and NGO people from the South. So I guess, you know, when Canadians talk about the South, we don't mean the global South. <laughs> 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 So they were all kind of suspicious, and, they, and they, they checked her out by reading, I guess, a few of the more celebrated judgments of the Ontario Court of Appeal, dealing with things like war crimes, the Finta decision, and there was something also on consent and rape, I think, anyway. They were a bit agitated about this, and uh, I didn't know Louise at the time. I'd never met her. I, I soon met her, but I knew about her mainly from Guy Conway, who had been her assistant on the Prison for Women uh, uh, Commission. And uh, he had just raved about her, and so I did my best to damage control to calm down these spirits. You know, the, the, the contribution she made, not just on the tribunals that she, for, of which she was the prosecutor, but she had a, a somewhat cor, cor, uh, what? S incidental impact on the drafting of the Rome Statute. Because when the Rome Statute was being drafted, mainly in 97, or above all in 98, at the conference, uh, the Rome Conference, uh, the central issue, really, the most controversial one, was the independent prosecutor. And there were horror stories about prosecutors. We had that crazy prosecutor in the United States, the one that was after Clinton, remember? Uh, Kenneth Starr, and people talked about the Dr. Strangelove prosecutor. and. The, the reassuring message about an independent prosecutor, and people wanted to say, no, actually, it will be a reasonable, sensible person. They would point to Louise Arbour. She was there as, she was kind of the model when we wanted to kind of calm down those attacks on the idea of an independent prosecutor. I had 15 minutes of fame in my life when Louise uh, stepped down as prosecutor. I think it was about well, it was 20 years today, isn't that a line from a song, 20 years ago today? And well, don't you remember, you stepped down, I think it was in May of 99, as prosecutor of the ICTY and the ICTR to, to take up an appointment of the Supreme Court of Canada um, at the height of the Kosovo conflict. And uh, uh, someone, Bill Stubner, I don't know if you know this, Louise, but you know, remember Bill Stubner who worked at the tribunals, put out the message to journalists that it would be a Canadian who would succeed her because that's the way things work in the United Nations, that this was a Canadian position and that I was the man, I was the guy who was going to be the next prosecutor. And it was all over the media, uh, the international media for, for about 18 hours. And, <laughs> and that was my, but, but for 18 hours I basked in the glory of all these people <laughs> talking about Louise Arbour and me in the same sentence. It was pretty cool. <laughs> well, you know, that was, uh, a lot has go gone by since then. Those were kind of heady days, 1999. The, the, the Yugoslavia Tribunal was just was thriving. Pinochet, we'd just been through the, the whole business with his arrest. He finally wasn't prosecuted, but he went home in, in, uh, ashamed to, to Chile. And, of course, the Rome Statute was starting to collect ratifications, and it was becoming clear that it was going to enter into force and all of that. When you spoke earlier about things that you kind of left behind or things you'd moved on from, I thought maybe international justice was, was one of them because you did many other things after that. But of course, you've kept an eye on it when you were at the International Crisis Group. I remember you making observations about the Security Council referrals to the court. And we were at a conference about five years ago at uh, Simon Fraser University where we spoke about international justice. I think maybe Fanny, you were there too. And uh, I remember Louise make, oh no, I'm sorry, it was a Chatham House rule. <laughs> I'm not allowed to say who said this thing. So just, let's just say a very wise, intelligent person who was at this small meeting, and it wasn't Fanny and it wasn't myself, so, you know, but there were other people there, um, spoke about the, the initiatives that the prosecutor of the, of the International Criminal Court had been making in Colombia. Um, at the time, the, the prosecutor had made submissions to the Constitutional Court of Colombia, and with the kind of wise observations that we heard earlier this evening as well, uh, this person uh, spoke about how, uh, you know, it wasn't 
necessarily the role for a prosecutor to be intervening in this way and wasn't very impressed with the work. I was very, I was very impressed by that insight and that comment about it. Well, international justice, just to wrap up, is now, you know, it's thriving in many ways, but it's it, the, the centerpiece of, the, of international justice, the International Criminal Court, is it's a bit wobbly. I, I don't know the right word for it, but it, it's going through a tough phase, and anyone who cherishes that institution is, is worried about the future of it. Um, I mentioned the, the model. Louise stood as a bit of a model for a prosecutor at the time. They are uh, now looking for the next prosecutor. They, they've started the search for the next prosecutor. I'm sure you're not interested in the job. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and I'm not proposing it. But, you know, if it was a younger uh, version, a new version of Louise Arbour, the way she was in 1996 when she took up the reins to, to ad hoc tribunals, if someone like that came along today, she or he probably wouldn't make the shortlist for being the prosecutor because they're actually, they're not looking for someone like Louise Arbour in 1996 or like Richard Goldstone in 1994 or for that matter like Robert Jackson in 1945. They're looking for kind of a more pedestrian, hardworking deputy prosecutor. That's the job description. And they don't, I think, don't, don't fully understand. Now, this is really the Assembly of States parties, but they need someone with vision and a leader to take the ICC into the next, uh, through the next decade. And they, 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 run, they need someone like, like Louise Arbour. Um, but they're not looking for them. And I think that's a shame. I'd be intrigued to hear your, your reactions or from others in the audience on it. But I think that's part of the problem because the most, the best prosecutors we ever had were people who'd never been prosecutors. Louise had not been a prosecutor in 1996. She'd been a terrific law professor and a terrific judge, but not a prosecutor. And uh, Richard Goldstone had never been a prosecutor. And Robert Jackson had never been a prosecutor. And they were fabulous international prosecutors as well. Does it go to you? Answer like you were in 1996. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think at this point, I, w I won't say much. I think maybe we'll have questions that will touch base on some of these issues. I will only say that I certainly don't disagree at all with Bill about the concerns that many of us have about the state of this institution. I will also say, with the great wisdom that comes from decades of working in the legal profession, and on that I'm sure Bill won't disagree with me either, law, legal institutions, take a long time to mature, to take roots. And maybe we were, um, we had unrealistic expectations about how long it would take. I think the project of international accountability through personal responsibility, criminal responsibility for war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. I think that project is irreversible, but I think it's gonna take a long time for the actual institutional framework to live up to, its, to the expectations. Two things in particular. What, what was supposed to distinguish the International Criminal Court from the two ad hoc tribunals that I was associated with was their universal vocation. Um, I've told the story many, many times. When I would go either to Serbia, uh, to, to when I would go to, to well, less so, I suppose, in Sarajevo, in Zagreb, in the parts of the former Yugoslavia, invariably I was asked by all kinds of people, civil society, journalists, certainly politicians, why us? Where were you in the killing fields of Cambodia? Where have you been for decades of, of, uh, of these kinds of activities taking place after Nuremberg? And then one day you picked on us. You know, what's the, what's the legitimacy of this enterprise? And it took me a long time to find an answer that I was satisfied with to answer that question. And eventually I would repeat to them time and again, the fact that others equally guilty are not being prosecuted doesn't make you less guilty, but I believe it does make it less just for us to prosecute only you. So the answer, my friend, is not to leave you alone. 
It's to mobilize you and others so we could prosecute everybody who needs to be prosecuted. That was the vocation of the International Criminal Court, and I think in large part, and I certainly won't say it's demise, we're not there, and we're, I don't think we'll get there, but I think a lot of the difficulties that it encounters, it's because its vocation to universality never materialized. So how can you continue to inspire confidence in a project when the court doesn't have jurisdiction over Syria? Uh, and on the other hand, has extensive jurisdiction over many countries in Africa. So the call of double, double standards, misunderstanding, uh, 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 perceptions of inadequacy and so on are very easy to, to mobilize. So I think the court is not in great shape. When you talk about uh, the selection of a new prosecutor, this poses one of the, the quintessential questions I've posed myself all my life. What is the most important thing? People or institutions? Well, in the end, you want both to be excellent. At certain times, you can have relatively mediocre people leading institutions that are so strong that they will survive the mediocrity of some of their current leadership. I'm not thinking of anybody in particular. <laughs> At other times, you have institutions that are actually quite frail and not well anchored, in which case the quality of personal leadership is critical. I, I do agree, I hadn't thought of it in those terms, Bill, but I do agree with you that I think for the court now, because the institution is still not fully rooted, its legitimacy is not fully established, the quality of the people who become the face of the institution is going to be very important. So if there's any candidate for prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, this is your day. I just thought, I, I, we have just a few minutes, on, on, I don't know if you want to add something, but I thought when you said what distinguishes the ICC from their two ad hoc tribunals, there's also the complementarity issue, which is the ICC was there as a second, as an alternative to national jurisdiction, and in my chapter that I wrote, to plug it, um, which is also linked to my thesis with Bill, I re just redo my stuff all the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we all do. Um, I, you said, you know, we're, you were wondering whether the, you know, the, 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 the naissance of the ICC would trigger more exercise of national jurisdiction, and you predicted some long time ago that yes, they would. And, and I wonder what you think of that, all of you, because there's a, there's a lot of setbacks. I think in Switzerland, there's been a lot of critiques of the uh, war crimes section, whatever it's called. In Canada, I've been really critical of their inaction over and over. But then again, the only hope for justice for Syria is found in the courts of Germany and, and other countries in Europe. So I'm wondering if, if that's still not to drop the ICC altogether, but whether the ICC has done something positive in sort of in, in terms of triggering states to exercise their, juris their jurisdiction against war criminals, and whether that's the real future of international justice, as some say. I, I think we have to be very careful in, you know, there's a distinction between coincidence, correlation, and consequence. The, the expansion of the principle of universal jurisdiction of national court or of national prosecutions for international crimes on the basis of a more traditional uh, national competence, I'm not sure to what extent it's attributable to the great success of the ICC, because this was always the paradox, right? The greatest success of the International Criminal Court would have been its closure, because it would have been overtaken by domestic prosecutions. This is not what's happening, let's be very clear. We can't say, you know, the failure of the ICC is attributable to this, to the fact that it's the, the default jurisdiction when nothing else happens, and there's such a plethora of, of activities in prosecuting uh, uh, atrocities. So I don't want to say there's a failure in the ICC, but and I, I do agree that we've seen in the last 20 years, basically since this whole project started, We've seen international accountability take many forms. Bill spoke of the right to truth. I mean, there are lots of forms, but I, I'm not absolutely persuaded that it's a consequence of the threat that the ICC is otherwise posing. I think these are parallel initiatives. I'll, um, 
pass the, the mic to, to Andrew to talk about human rights. Uh, and maybe, I don't know if you're going to talk about that because that touches on, but maybe also the focus on individual criminal liability is something we have to think about because, uh, for instance, corporate accountability, even in the criminal law sphere or other spheres, maybe you'll talk about, or state liability, as Francoise has offered a chapter on this, state immunity often blocks uh, the, the accountability of states as entity for human rights violations, and so that's also part of the sort of future maybe of, of the thinking about that, to not move away from individual criminal liability, but also to think more broadly about this. Mr. Platt. Um, thank you. Well, Bill suggested that international criminal law is going through a bit of a wobbly phase, was your expression, which I think is an understatement. <laughs> and in the same vein, I think human rights is going through a rocky patch. Um, and I've listed some of the things that have been put to me over the last year. There was a headline on the BBC that we are living in a post-human rights world. It's the Geneva correspondent of the BBC. <laughs> Um, there have been books on the end times of human rights and a recent article about saving human rights from human rights law. And last week we had a book launch about a book called Rescuing Human Rights. Um, and we've discussed this a little beforehand and I'm often called on in these events, uh, there was one recently called The End Times of Human Rights to defend human rights and I'm happy to do so because I think it, it's worth defending. But at a certain point, they're like, well, he's the human rights professor. Without human rights, he's out of a job. So, of course, <laughs> he's defending it. Um, but is it really that bad? And over the weekend, I, I sort of had a thought, what's going on in human rights? And I just looked through my emails that were coming in. And the first one, um, I'm afraid, did sort of heighten. We have to be careful about being skeptical about human rights. But I'm just going to give you one thing from the news that came in was the US executive determining that arms sales to Saudi Arabia should go ahead despite the fact that Congress has said that this was contributing to human rights. And to sort of pick up your theme, we have sort of politics overriding law in a way. I mean, they're relying on what's called a legal loophole. Um, but, you know, do we have here politics over law or is it politicians' attitudes to law that is changing? And, you know, I'd like to say, well, of course, the judges will put this right. But unfortunately, it, this is an area where we will have judicial deference to the executive. So maybe I've chosen a particularly sort of tricky point, but it, it's just one thing that happened over the weekend. And the other, again, doesn't give us a lot of hope, was the decisions being taken in Iraq with regards to the execution of French nationals for having had some association with ISIS in Syria. And again, I was sort of being uh, asked to explain, you know, the human rights dimension of this. And, you know, first of all, the death penalty seems to be applied without adequate respect for the rules there. There's no fair trial. And yet it's the Western countries which are encouraging this and somehow failing to step up. And, I mean, maybe I'll put it back to Louise because I know we, we had a discussion earlier and there's a bit of a response to this, but we're, we're meeting a bit of a crisis where the West has been constantly telling everybody to behave in human rights terms but both of my examples have really put us on the back foot in terms of, well, where are the human rights champions now? There's a great line in the book, which is from none of us, um, but it's in the foreword, um, which I just reread uh, before coming. And it sort of reminded me uh, of these thoughts. And that was um, by Kofi Annan, the late Kofi Annan. And this is what he says in the foreword. An edifice of peace and prosperity is always weakened when public power is left unchecked and human dignity is forfeited for security or profit. And I'm afraid I, I sort of rather feel that's a bit where we are, but I'm sort of going to turn to Louise maybe to, to not cheer us up, but uh, <laughs> sort of remind me that, 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 that it is still worth fighting for and it's still there. Again, it's, it's really difficult to set the right tone. For years, I thought that we, we in the human rights community were, had turned into a cheerleading club. We spent a lot of time talking to each other. Um, and this was at a time where, as I said to Andrew before, I, for one, thought that progress was linear and there was only one way to go, was more and better all the time. And it was certainly true in the decades of norms, development, uh, unpacking general norms to be more specific and so on. And at the same time, we were, I think, deaf to claims that we often felt were not made in good faith. For instance, many claims from developing countries that uh, 
the human rights agenda was a, a, essentially a Western agenda, that the so-called universality of rights was purely a reflecting of a Western point of view. It was very easy to just revert to doctrine and say, no, no, that's not true. It is truly universal. Well, that's pretty well the end of that conversation. And, and I think we were maybe too quick to dismiss some of the concerns. Not all these concerns, frankly, were expressed in good faith, I think, but some were. In my opinion, there's no doubt that the evolution of, of human rights since the Universal Declaration was dominated by a Western vision of human rights that was primarily interested in civil and political rights and was extremely slow, reluctant um, to embrace economic and social rights as rights. Uh, it, maybe it was anchored in a general belief that a healthy market would actually look after the right to health. And so there was no reason to believe that an equal and equitable redistribution of wealth, for instance, would come from the mere sort of generosity of spirit of those who benefited the most from its creation. But this was very anchored, I think, in the, the Western promotion of rights. I'm not sure how instrumental it's be, it has been in, and again, I won't say its demise, but the setback, I think, that the international human rights agenda is currently experiencing. There's a second aspect which always troubled me, which is the mere expression human rights. Uh, language is critical. It is very obscure. You, sometimes people have conversations about human rights, but if you really press them, what they have in mind is not necessarily the same thing, the same right. And in fact, if you stop people on the street and you said, name three human rights, a lot of them would just draw a blank. Uh, uh, I don't know, torture? <laughs> the right to vote? I don't know. It's, it, it, it is a convenient way to speak in, with a, in a lot of abstraction. Um, and it has implications on so many aspects of, of politics, of public policy choices, and so on. And so I think we made, we promoters of a human rights agenda have made a lot of mistakes. The reason I'm confident that we will regain some momentum is that, frankly, I can't see any at the end of the day, reasonably attractive alternative as a method of organizing societies. The danger is that if we let it slip too far, I think authoritarian regimes, like the rule of force will basically take over. And then it will become extremely difficult to regain the ground. But as long as we can continue, first of all, that we speak with clarity. And not, I'll tell you, give you an example. In my own country, province of Quebec, right now, there is a big uh, debate, which is at the heart of very fundamental human rights issues, and that is a, a law that will come into force, I have no doubt about that, on uh, secularism, la laïcité, uh, prohibiting the display of religious symbols by state employees, including public school teachers in the primary school sector. So essentially, I don't think there's anybody is, is uh, being duped by what the object of the law is. It's targeting, in my opinion, very clearly Muslim women. Um, the government's position is, one, that this is a very moderate law, I suppose. Yeah, if you were considered deporting them or executing them, that would be moderate. <laughs> I don't know what it means to say it's moderate. I don't think it's moderate. Then they say it's very popular, which is true. Opinion polls show that the vast majority of people support that position, which is precisely why you need to pause. You know, minority protection only makes sense when, in fact, there's an overwhelming, that's called the tyranny of the majority, but there's very little, and then to add insult to injury, the government is moving with a provision that would exclude this legislation from judicial review. Yeah, it's not cool. <laughs> this, this is really not cool. This is where we are. It's one thing, and then there's, you know, you look at other things. I, it is critical that we speak with clarity. And again, when I, in the public debate in Quebec about this legislation, you hear people say all the time, well, 
it's about our specificity and our values. Yeah? Name three of our values. <laughs> Solidarity, empathy, I don't know, what values? And then, if pressed, they'll say, la laïcité. Is that a value? What does, what does that mean? Nothing means anything. We speak in abstract terms. We don't speak with clarity. So I think we need to reclaim, and I won't say the moral high ground. That's an easy claim to make. But we re have to reclaim in the human rights agenda the sense of the centrality of it. That's another thing. Maybe we, we dissipated a bit. We chased a lot of issues. There's a lot of hubris. You know, We thought this agenda had only one way to go was forward. Now we've hit a brick wall. And it may very well be that it will force us to rethink from first principles. Uh, it's a very persuasive case to, to be made, but now is the time, I think, to make it. It's interesting because uh, a few special rapporteurs uh, wrote to the Quebec government expressing uh, concerns about this legislation. And uh, the wide reaction from us was, uh, the UN get out of our internal issues, which is exactly what states with dictatorship have also argued. And when you say that, then it becomes really a matter of you are trying to talk from above, you know, as a lawyer, as a professor, you know, the, this debate is always, it's not very different in different countries. And they said the same thing in many countries about the global compact for migration. And so we turn to this issue uh, of migration, which you probably see now. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I, I want to say a few words about the Migration Compact, which is highlighted in Louise's um, title on the board here. And then I'll come back to some things that, that we've been discussing. I think the Global Compact is perceived in two very different ways, depending whether one looked at it from before or with the benefit of hindsight. I think looking back on it, uh, at least this is the way the Secretary General sees it, and many in New York, is it really was a success at a time when the UN is achieving very few successes, not least because of the retreat on multilateralism. But it was something of a bitter success, or a success that left a, a bittersweet aftertaste, because there was this strange phenomenon that a compact that was almost universally agreed to in October, September, suddenly by the time of its formal adoption in December in Marrakesh, uh, about a dozen states backtracked. Some of them backtracked, including um, my, my own Chile, uh, literally as the ambassador uh, was flying to, to Marrakesh. And then he arrived to find out that he was meant to give a, a, a different speech. And not only did that happen, but that happened in a way that the UN, apart from the Security Council, usually slaving away in total obscurity, it happened in a very public way. I mean, a, a government fell in, um, in Belgium, in, uh, in Switzerland, um, and perhaps this has never happened in the history of Swiss diplomats. Uh, a diplomat was accused of being a traitor, one of the most exceptional diplomats Switzerland has, I have to say, was vilified in social media in his own um, country. And it suddenly became apparent that this was, was shaking a certain part of the world and leading to a violent um, backlash, uh, something that we were not um, uh, used to. So that, that, that was why it was a little bitter, bittersweet. But having said that, I worked um, for on the, um, with uh, Louise's, arguably Louise's predecessor, Karen Abouzaid, um, who negotiated the, the New York um, Declaration that, that led to the compact um, for a few months in, in early 2016, so about two and a half years before uh, Marrakesh. And at that time, if somebody had told us somebody will come along and get a global compact that all but whatever it was, 180 states will sign up to, we would have burst into laughter. It would have been considered completely uh, impossible, certainly anything of substance, perhaps a rather shallow um, uh, political declaration calling for better cooperation we might have considered feasible, but something along the lines of the document that was adopted by the vast majority of states 
would have been considered completely un, un, unrealistic. Migration, unlike refugees, was always seen as a bilateral issue, an issue between the, the, the giving and the receiving state. And where um, uh, uh, migration was not regulated by such bilateral agreement, it was considered highly undesirable and something that, is, in essence, should be stopped. And it was considered something that the UN should stay well away from. And many voices were saying that, and the voices, many, many of them from Latin America, were saying the opposite. Few people thought they would um, prevail. And the US position, even under the former administration, was highly uh, ambiguous on the issue. So I think it is a tribute um, to uh, Louise just how much uh, was achieved. And I would argue that the backlash was part of that tribute because, I, I mean, it showed it was something um, in important. And it was shown that the UN, um, uh, in a way, uh, matters. Um, I think what was very obvious in the backlash, and this brings me to the point of, of Louise's uh, uh, talk about the increasing, are we in a, uh, a new era, and is that new era characterized by the subservience of law to politics? Um, I, I, I think what was obvious in the backlash against migration is that it was fiction driven. It was driven completely by lies. I think there was some Lithuanian um, public commentator who was so frustrated that he took to a radio show and read for seven hours the whole thing because there were so many lies circulating about it. And I saw in Chile that I had arguments with good friends because all the opposition was based on lie. I mean, simple un untruths. And I would argue it's a little bit the same when it comes to terrorism. It's a little bit the same when it comes to drugs. They're policies based on mistruths. They're policies based on um, truths that are considered convenient from a political point of view that rally voters, often fear-based, misinformation-based, appealing to the worst uh, parts of our human uh, nature, um, but uh, don't withstand um, uh, uh, scrutiny. Um, and of course, when it comes to migration, you know, some, some very eminent um, publications like The Economist that nobody can uh, achieve of being, you know, far on the left, on the fringe, have made uh, the same uh, points. And I think Louise was very instrumental in bringing more truth um, into the, the, the discussion. But I would argue that perhaps the era we're living in is not, less is different, but if anything, it's maybe a post-truth era. It's not necessarily, uh, I, I'm the one non-lawyer on this, on this um, panel, and I'm very glad that there's gonna be uh, a new declaration, not just to make sure that every panel has uh, at least one woman on it, but that every panel has at least one non-lawyer on it. <laughs> I think um, that, that might be equally important. Um, uh, measure against discrimination. But um, um, th that was politically incorrect, sorry. Um, um, but um, the, 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 so, so I think uh, we, the, the instrumentation, instrumentalization of, of law for politics is certainly not new. I mean, it, it exists, I would argue, as long as government exists. Perhaps it's happening anew in certain countries where we'd got into a certain complacency that it didn't happen, although you know, Guantanamo happened before the current president of the, of the US. Um, and uh, there are many other examples in Western uh, com countries. We dealt with the Extraordinary Renditions Program, um, where many Western countries um, were um, in involved. So I'm not so, so sure it's new. And I remember visiting with Louise Sri Lanka in 2008, um, where I was completely dumbfounded, Louise much less so, because she'd seen such things before, how an incredibly sophisticated um, edifice of rule of law had been built up to essentially maintain an environment of the total absence of the rule of law, to essentially protect certain perpetrators from doing exactly what they wanted in terms of rape, in terms of forced disappearances, in terms of abduction, in terms of, of killing, etc., etc., etc. And it was all done 
with a wonderful veneer and architecture of, of, of law around it. Of course not rule of law in the sense that Louise introduced um, um, uh, the importance of the rule of law uh, at the outset, but nevertheless, so I, I think you know the, the death of truth is is perhaps um, as much the problem um, as the subservience of of law to politics, and perhaps they go um, hand in hand. Now I'll conclude with just one thing. I think one of the perceptions out there is, of course, that um, all migrants or all potential uh, people from the south given half a chance, and I don't mean um, um, uh, the Canadian South, although it might be true of them as well, um, <laughs> given half a chance would flood um, to better off um, um, countries. Um, and there's survey after survey that shows this isn't, this isn't true. Most Africans would much prefer to migrate to the extent they want to migrate within Africa than come to, to, to Europe. Um, but... You know, in the UN, we have a similar um, uh, perception that given half a chance, everybody would love to be employed um, by the UN. Um, but uh, I can say, certainly Canadians, um, <laughs> um, I can say in the case of Louise, this, this is not true, and I'm committing an indiscretion, but I think in her fir for her first job, um, from, from what she told me, she really did, she really did want... Uh, the job, but every other job after that, she had to have her arm um, twisted. Um, and I think Coffee had to, you know, go down on her knee, his knees. I don't know how many times to convince her to come to to, to OHCHR. And I think uh, Antonio Guterres uh, also had to beg her to come back to do the migration job. And I can be really indiscreet and say that Louise has been approached since and has turned it down. And I think like, like many people, like many migrants, she doesn't really want to leave home. She wants to stay <laughs> close to her loved ones. So I think the only way of ever getting Louise back to the UN and back to some of her former loves um, is by moving her loved ones. And in fact, <laughs> Well, you could move the UN to Montreal. No, I think it's in fact, in the case of Louise, just one loved one. Um, called Schnorro, um, which is a very large dog. Um, so I think the only chance of getting her to become um, the prosecutor of the ICC is if Schnorro could be the deputy prosecutor. <laughs> and uh, Bill, if you're willing to advance, uh, I'm willing to advance that idea with the Secretary General. Thank you. <laughs> Exactly. Um, considering the time and this beautiful ending, we won't let Louise uh, talk about snow for too long. Um, we have about 10 minutes, if I'm correct, Jacqueline, uh, to have questions. I think there are um, superstar students in the back with uh, microphones. So if you have any questions for Louise or for any of the panelists, please raise your hand and they'll uh, get to you. This, this gentleman. This gentleman there, and this lady there. Good evening, my excellence. I am a NGO of indigenous people in Human Rights Council. I, I was very happy to meet it sometime in the Palais de Nation. Uh, I remembered your statement you're, you work in for Human Rights Council. I am, I am a indigenous people. In indigenous people, today, in the dangerous situation of Chile, the Mapuches, grave violation against the Mapuche people. Many, many violations against the People, Canada, Canada, sell on my letter of my friend, a little child. Do you know a little child? <clears throat> Today, you state that the contemporary international law responded to, to the concrete response to the problem of the 
and the well-being. Today, we, we see many, many a grave violation of Human Rights Council in all the country, in all the country, especially Western, Western country violate the Human Rights Council if, if many country, if, if, uh, for example, if, uh, Libya, Libya, NATO is bombing, bombing with the missile, French missile, sir. Uh, Khalid, sir, sorry to President, President Gaddafi. Sorry, sir. Why, why you responded to the question, concrete question, to grave violation of human rights in the world? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take a few questions and then, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I would, because the time is limited. Uh, please go ahead and then a lady in front. Yes. Good evening, uh, High Commissioner. Uh, Lee Starber, and I started at the West Theatre when you were at, uh, okay, I, I, let me stand, when you were High Commissioner. I have one question. I, I thought that I'm going to ask you one question, but I totally changed my mind. You mentioned about secularism, and just last week, Modi in India elected against that concept, and now in India, we are in whole region actually under threat that that concept secularism which was developed after Second World War and also after the partition and that is now under threat in that part of the region. So definitely the how you'd like to see that concept, this concept has been developed. It is a concept, it is a belief and maybe it has different meaning in other part of the world but I would like to have your response that how you'd like to respond. Uh, now the minority, they are under threat because of the erosion of uh, secularism in the subcontinent. Thank you. Um, hi, Madame and former Justice Arbor. As a young Canadian law student studying in Quebec, it's a really a pleasure to be here and to have heard you tonight. My question is, what advice would you give to young Canadian law students to fill their toolboxes with good experiences and practices to counter human rights violations like Bill 21? Because as a law student, we feel kind of helpless. What can we do besides writing letters to the government? But maybe you can provide some insight into experiences and practices that we can use to feel useful. I really hate to give advice to young law students. You have tools at your disposal that I, that I didn't even know would even exist in, when I was a law student. So um, speak up, uh, just tell them they're on the right track, get down in the streets. And I find one of the most encouraging uh, 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 form of political engagement now is these young, even too young to vote uh, students uh, speaking up about climate change. So uh, yeah, speak up and tell them you're a lawyer or just about and you care. Uh, let me just say a few things about secularism. You know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the, the child or the brainchild of the Roosevelt Four Freedoms. Huh? Freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom of expression, and freedom of religion. We very often forget uh, the, the last, again, talk about the Western world's preference has always been for freedom from fear above freedom from want and freedom of expression about, above freedom of religion. I mean, I don't want to get into a lot of details, but in my opinion, the, the, the obligation of a secular state is to create an open uh, field for religious expressions to flourish, including an equal space for those who have no religious affiliation. Um, what we often see is la laïcité, or secularism, often carries with it a kind of secular cultural baggage um, that reflects the dominant religion. In Quebec, we call that la catholaïcité. So it's secularism that is loaded. People think that Christmas trees and nativity scenes are not religious. They're just cultural. Well, it doesn't feel that way if you're not a Catholic. So. 
it's very difficult to get into a lot of specifics, but in general terms, I think the governments uh, in all its manifestations have to preserve a space for those who do not believe and for those who believe in different fashions uh, and expressing no preference and certainly no marginalization for any group. And uh, I can't get into a lot of details about your questions on the rights of indigenous peoples. I think this is uh, the, the, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which took place uh, at the time that I was the High Commissioner, was a step in the right direction. When we talk about protection of uh, minority rights, that should be at the forefront of issues in many countries, including in my own. I had a question for um, Mr. Hothschild. Uh, uh, I agree very much with what you said that I think we are living in a kind of post-truth world. And we at the United Nations, as well as colleagues working for academic institutions, other NGOs and other organizations, um, our job consists of trying to establish the fact of collecting data, of collecting information, of publishing this information. And one question I would have, um, how do you think what can we do to better um, you know, draw attention to the facts and to the information that we and others do have? And how, what steps can we do to better contribute to the public debate in this issue? And in a way, protect the, the, the authoritiveness, the legitimacy of truth. Thank you. Um, thanks so much to all of you for your comments today. Um, I have a question about something that came up uh, there's a tension, I think, that came up around international criminal law and criminal law uh, and human rights. Um, some of you talked about the imperative of rule of law as enforcing human rights law, but you guys also talked about the prosecutions in Iraq and how those have been sort of threatening to human rights, um, particularly around executions and um, uh, sort of poor uh, due process, for example, um, and with very, very extreme support. Um, and while, of course, those aren't technically international prosecutions, they have, they in a way are, because they were empowered and enabled and funded heavily by the Security Council and the UN as a whole. Um, so I sort of wonder how the sort of anti-impunity and international criminal law and criminal law project can be in better communication and less tension with the Human Rights Project. Uh, on that, two quick points. Um, I, I, there, there's something called the Edelman Trust Barometer that many of you uh, may have seen. It's, it's run by a corporation out of the US that does, um, over the past 20 years or so, has looked at where people in different countries put their um, credence, what, what, audience, what speakers do they listen to. And of course, post 2008, the business community went way down, they're now coming back up. Um, then uh, the, the person on the street, the person who, who, who you meet, went way up as, as, as earning trust. Um, uh, uh, this, he showed us in a presentation recently um, with the Secretary General, but his point was that experts are actually back after having been discredited um, a, a long time. Experts are back and the UN is back. As, as seen as trustworthy um, interlocutors. But his point was that we ha we're, we're very poor at disseminating, um, uh, of taking advantage of the trust we actually have. Um, so we need to get much better uh, uh, communications, which won't come to a surprise to anybody who's worked um, uh, for the UN. But his other finding, which I thought almost more interesting, because the thing about communications is not surprising, is that we live in an era where people don't necessarily trust certain sources of news, but nevertheless go to them. So mainstream media, according to Edelman, is much more trusted than social media. And yet, an increasing number of people look to social media for their news, 
as opposed to mainstream media. So we're almost in an era, and this is where I think there's a game changer, where people are not necessarily looking for their truth. They're looking for a narrative, a narrative that serves their identity, that serves the threats to their dignity more than um, the truth. And I think social media, uh, and I would say that's another game changer to our era, um, nurtures that. Uh, and I don't think we've got our heads around it, and I think in the UN we have to get our heads around that better, um, um, what exactly um, this new digital era, which is massively transformational, means. And in terms of truth, let me share one anecdote, which I think is true, but since I'm not a lawyer, you won't hold me strictly to the truth. Um, some of you will remember um, Elon Musk, who incidentally just got the highest bonus in the history of the world, $2.3 billion he earned last year, um, was uh, when these people were trapped in a cave in Thailand, um, and he sent a submarine, a special submarine, to try and help them. And a British diver who was, who was doing real work there um, did a tweet um, saying this is just a pure publicity stunt. And Elon Musk um, did a counter tweet um, accusing him with, li 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 I mean, saying he was a pedophile um, and he, he had no, as a pedophile, he should just shut up. And this British driver took him to court in California for, for libel. Um, and in his defense, Elon Musk argued that in the Twitter sphere, um, truth doesn't matter. In the Twitter sphere, the fact whether this guy was or was not a pedophile was totally immaterial because everybody knew in social media that it was a post-truth space. Now, I don't know what the outcome of the case was, but the very fact that he could advance that argument and that we are in an era where, where narrative is more important than truth, facts, and that that's accepted in the area where we most draw our media from, and it's not just draw it from, where we're fed it, because it's fed to us by algorithms that reinforce our prejudices, um, I think says, says a lot. And I think in the UN we need to get our head much more around that. But it, who said this is accepted? He just said it. He said the truth doesn't matter, anything goes, you could say anybody's a pedophile. Does anybody say that's right? Did the court say, yeah, good point? <laughs> it's just outrageous. It's just, this is not true. It's, anyway, uh, where was I? <laughs> I got distracted on this uh, truth-seeking uh, exercise. And, but I have to say, it, it's um, just on this point, I, I'll make two points. The first one is, as a judge, which I was for a large part of my career, we're supposed to be in the truth-finding business. But everybody understands that it is the truth, as will emerge through a set of rules, very rigorous rules that exclude certain background information, permit only some to be, that will be ascertained in a courtroom. It's not a historical truth because the, the history can always be revisited. Three or four years later, you discover a new document, you revisit the Second World War history is being constantly rewritten. The truth that you determine in a courtroom, which leads to the attribution of responsibility, either civil responsibility, criminal, is governed by an in, a, a quite actually complex set of rules, but nobody is under any kind of delusion that from that emerges an objective truth that if you had a time machine and you could rewind, you would be proven accurate. All you could do is, again, a kind of do no harm, exclude um, information that would be so persuasive in a corrosive way that it could dominate the conversation, for instance, uh, the, past sex, uh, the past history, sexual history, criminal history of a witness in the appreciation of their credibility could be so prejudicial. You exclude certain elements. So when we talk about truth, um, what is it we're, we're talking about? And for what purpose, I think, is a, is a valid question. And I think if we're talking about the modern world, I think there's immensely interesting speculation about how much 
intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence is gonna be able to tell us about the likely reconstruction of historical facts. When lawyers talk about whether something is, has been demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt or on a balance of probability, it's basically, we're working on the basis of sort of algorithm that come from our human experience. Well, now we're gonna be able to validate or not some of that in a very different way um, moving forward. I'm not sure that I can answer very much your question except to say that I think certainly in my role as a prosecutor, Bill pointed out that I'd never been a prosecutor before in as much as we could be extremely motivated to prosecute war criminals. I felt throughout, I still feel very strongly today that we need to be constrained in that pursuit by all the safeguards that have been put in place to preclude the conviction of an innocent, to give any person charged with crime, certainly with serious crimes, the opportunity to make a full answer in defense, to be adequately represented. I think all these safeguards have to be put in place. So it is outrageous that uh, uh, they could be acquiescence to the application of the death penalty in any trial, particularly in trials where the fundamental rules of procedural fairness are unlikely to be applied. So I think this balance is at the heart, I think, of, of the human rights agenda. Just a word. Uh, uh, truth is my chapter in the book. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't tell you everything that's in the chapter. It's about the tensions on the right to truth and historical truth and how international law is is kicking up obstacles to digging into the past, just as it's easing the way to find out about the past. But you have to buy the book, really, to get the story. <laughs> I would be kind of violating copyright even to tell you what's in there. Um, it's not, the right to truth isn't in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of course. It's, it, some of these things we can find sort of tucked away in there and implied in it. And then there's another right that's not really overtly in the Universal Declaration. You can't pin an article on it, but it's in the title of the book, which is about peace. And it's, I think the title is great because it links peace with human rights. And that's something that sometimes gets, gets lost in the discussion. Someone referred to international criminal justice and sort of the punitive dimension. And we sometimes forget that we're, we're, we are out for justice, but it's to get peace as well. It's not as if one comes before the other, but we wouldn't want to lose peace because of justice any more than we want the opposite to happen. Well, we have to wrap up. Um, if Bill's chapter is about truth, Mono's chapter is about fact-finding. <laughs> so, and how the UN is doing better as we go. So this is pretty much a theme, I think. And Fabrizio's chapter is about leadership and what kind of courage and personal characteristics and institutional characteristics are needed for leaders to emerge as a real uh, change makers in the world. And so we have in front of you, I'm not talking about myself, in front of you great leaders uh, that we're lucky to have. And I want to thank you, the four of you, for this uh, great uh, presence of yours tonight. Let's give them a clap. Thank you. And thank you all for coming.